Hello, welcome. Uh, and it's really quite a privilege to be able to participate in this conference. Uh, I mean, I think it's been really pretty impressive um, and really an honor to be the last wrap-up session here. As we begin, after spending so much time looking at the problems, to explore possibilities for reform. Uh, so I, I think we're all really uh, privileged and lucky to have here with us today three, uh, three people whose work touches on this issue from a variety of angles, all of which is really fascinating. Um, and I, I've learned so much just from, from trying to get up to speed on what they do. Um, so I, and I look forward to learning more here this afternoon. Uh, so let me just go ahead and inter introduce our speakers, and then we can jump right into it, because I'm sure you'll, you all will have quite a number of questions um, after we have a chance to hear them talk. So we are going to begin with uh, Alina Mungia Pipivi. Is that how I pronounce her name? Great. She's the professor of Demo democracy studies at the Hertie School of Governance. Um, she teaches democratization and policy analysis. She previously studied political science at Harvard University after completing a PhD in social psychology in 1995 in Romania. And she now chairs the European Research Center for Anti-Corruption and State Building Research and co-directs the EU FP75 Year Research Project on Anti-Corruption. So uh, Alina, do you want to? Thank you. Sure. So I'm disclosed now that everybody found out the year of my first PhD, you know how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So thank you for staying after the break, and I join Professor Borostein in thanking you for inviting us here from the Anticorp team. The mentioned 95 PhD in social psychology was actually uh, a PhD on the authoritarian personality applied to, to post-communist Europe. So in fact, I have great uh, respect and admiration for historical uh, new school, and I'm very proud to be here. What I will try to do today is uh, to provide a theoretical framework allowing us to think about solutions in an organized way. I'm not going to give you a recipe of solutions, but I am going to try to explain how contexts matter and what type of solutions you can think of in different, in various contexts. I will not go into empirics very much because I do not have the time in 20 minutes, but everything, all the evidence that we have is published on our web pages. Anticorruption.eu is my personal web page, and the web page of this European framework project is anticorp.eu, where you will find research from many other colleagues as well. So, the Grand research questions that I work with are why do some societies manage to control corruption so it manifests itself only occasionally as an exception, why others do not and remain systematically corrupt? Is the superior performance of the first group of countries a result of something that they do or rather a result of who they are? And I'll explain this distinction, although I think it's fairly obvious for most of you. How has this control of corruption where it exists got built historically? And what lessons can we derive from this for the current anti-corruption policies? This is why, surprisingly enough, for a former social psychologist now working as an econometrist in a policy school, is that the paper that I'm going to publish in, uh, in social research, it's actually 80% seems to be a historical paper. It's not a historical paper because it's not an original archives, but it's a process tracing paper, actually, going from medieval to through modern times to contemporary times. And for me to work and answer these three questions, I have to select a definition of corruption. Today, I think it was very interesting and intellectually stimulating that we covered so many grounds. But definitely, we didn't speak about the same thing. We spoke about things which had different meanings in different cultural contexts. And it would be rather difficult to label them one under corruption if I am to give any meaningful answers on why some countries control it and others not, right? Therefore, I have to make some choices. And here are my choices. And here is actually my way of choosing among these definitions. So first, on this question, which seems to be like number one question, what is corruption? 
I answer that you always have to know a given governance context in order to answer this question. So my preliminary question is actually what type of transaction, of government transaction, is the exception and what type is the norm? In other words, what is an institution? If you are an economist, what is the rule of the game? If you are an anthropologist, beyond an individual instance or situation of corruption in order to understand this. My second question is there, is this the case, presuming you answer the first question, also in the private domain, in relations between private and private, as well as in the public domain, between government and whoever, company, person, private person? So there is quite an important social society dimension. I do not believe that governments operate out of their societal context, so we have to understand what the exchange mode, if you remember the Eisenstadt and Ronnegat book, what the exchange mode is in the society at large in order to understand the rules by which government operates. And therefore, the question number one, what is corruption, becomes actually question number three in this logic, and my first step in understanding the context in a country where I look at. So my concepts four are quite holistic. I define governance of a set of formal and informal institution determining who gets what in a society. You recognize this. I just adjusted this for my needs. And I think that this is the basic rule of the game in politics. Right? This is the main stake. This is what politics is about, who gets what. And therefore, it's quite important to introduce this element that there might be informal rules determining who gets what and not just formal ones, constitutions and other things which seem very important if you live in a developed country. I use the term governance order, also relating to the North Weingast and Wallace book, if you may have read it, Violence and Social Orders, to argue that salient and stable rules of the game exist, so you can identify what kind of governance orders exist in a society. And then I argue that control of corruption is capacity of a society to constrain corrupt behavior, to enforce norm of individual integrity, and a state which is free from capture of particular interest, and thus able to promote public interest and social welfare. So very simple for me, corruption is abuse of public authority which results in deviations from ethical universalism and public goods allocation. You know what ethical universalism is because many of you are students in, in philosophy, I have noticed. It basically means everybody is treated similarly. Everybody benefits from similar treatment. Governance orders should not, should see, I'm presenting you know the ideal types, but they should be really like put in a, in a, on a continuum, and they're very simple. Is type number one, corruption is the exception and ethical universalism is the rule, right? And this is a situation earlier referred to as individual corruption, as abuse of trust and conversion of authority into undue private profit, and we encountered this under all regimes, under all historical regimes, under all type. I mean, you can have autocratic monarchy, you can have whatever, this individual corruption exists anytime. But you have the second type of, of governance order, which is particularism is actually a rule. All allocations have a meaning. They are not really following the random distribution of, of ethical universalism. And the ethical universalism is the exception. And this is a situation which I see that is frequently quoted in literature as institutional corruption these days. So basically it means a systematic abuse of authority exists, which channels public resources which should be universal to particular private groups and persons. So my method is as follows. I do historical process tracing, countries which manage to build control of corruption. I do contemporary process tracing. I study newly achieved control of corruption, of which I have very few. If you're a governance scholar, you know that. Very few countries made it in the last 20, 30 years. And I do econometrics also with both contemporary and historical data. Overall, as you actually heard today, because a lot of what I do is just you know, building upon previous very good previous literature, I find two factors which I describe in this, in this paper in, in social research, which is called Becoming Denmark. Why is it called Becoming Denmark? I mean, you know, because Denmark is everybody's ideal of, uh, of good governance. You know, I just picked it actually from some World Bank colleagues, not the title itself, but they're all the time saying, how to get to Denmark, how to do this? Well, you know, we get to get to Denmark. First, let's see how Denmark has done it, and then we'll, we'll also do it. So the two factors are really opportunity, resources, 
which are basically size of public resources which can be spoiled, jobs, tax money, assets such as natural resources, and they increase with the scope of the, of the state generally. And the second factor is, are the deterrence and constraints, and here I interpret them far greater than legal or judicial deterrence, because obviously, Obviously, if corruption is, if particularism is the norm, as I argue, then it is a hierarchical pyramid, and the people on top will also appoint the judiciary, so the judiciary is also going to be corrupt. So what matters are like broader constraints than just the judiciary in a society, which means political and social pluralism. You have to have citizens who have enough autonomy to resist corruption regime, to have collective action capacity to resist corruption regime, not to have poor, disempowered citizens whose vote can be bought with, with one dollars because they're at the survival limit all the time. And this equilibrium model, which I call it, makes it that control of corruption is achieved when an equilibrium is established between these resources and these constraints in any given society. And there's a lot of empirical evidence made by economists documenting both these two. Only, I only rank them, I only you know, put them under these two categories because it is simpler to, to operate with it. So then, therefore, when we look across history, we see this interesting situation, which answers some questions that people have in political development, which is that power discretion decreases historically, at least in Europe. I only study Europe. My paper is only looking at European history and anyway, for 2,000 years, so it's more than enough. So power discretion decreases, not linearly as I presented here. This is obviously a simplification. Why? Accountability grows. Political modernization comes in. New groups are co-opted, right? And you arrive at this, uh, this democratic uh, high accountability systems that you have in developed countries. But spoils, strange enough, spoils resources, as I called them earlier, opportunity, increase. Increased very much from early feudal times when, for instance, a war was not paid from the public purse because public purse did not exist in early feudalism, right? The monarch paid himself for the war. If he appointed somebody with a job, that person was supposed to do it from his own income, an earl, right, or whoever was, chief magistrate. The chief magistrate would do it based on his estate. He was not paid from tax money, right? And therefore, as the state progresses, the spoils, the potential spoils, increase greatly. So strange enough, this answers the question of Sam Huntington, if you remember, who asked in political order, why does modernization, who is actually supposed to solve the problem of corruption, right? Modernization, as Weber teaches us, comes with this uh, nice, clean bureaucrats imper who impersonally treating everybody manage to create a state who's autonomous from private interest and enforces some sort of collective interest. But this doesn't seem to happen outside Europe very much, does it? And the answer is here. The answer, or the rather obvious answer, is that the many attempts to modernization of societies where modernization was made top down, and it was not the product of an organic evolution of society demanding better institutions, created the 80 something countries that we have today, which are in the same time democracies and about 40 others, which are not democracies at all. So 120 countries today where corruption is actually the rule, where ethical universalism is the exception. And these countries claim to be modern countries. In other words, they increase the spoil, they increase the scope of the state a lot. They pretend to do a lot, but they cannot do anything. And their power discretion had not actually evolved historically to decrease at the level that we have. And therefore, they are really in an area of very low constraints and very high opportunities. So they are quite hopelessly corrupt. And the question is, and they're also stable. These are fairly stable equilibria. It's not easy to shake them out of this situation. So question is, what do you do to, to grow out of this? And I look in the paper at three different, what I would call broadly political governance regimes. 
And I look in them in order to understand simply where do the grand anti-corruption tools and designs come from. And regime number one I look at is, is monarchy. And what I find in older monarchies, so it's rather obvious you know, for a historian, is that actually favor being the rule of the game in a classic autocratic monarchy, corruption was simply loss of favor. Right, and the example that I managed to find in an archive in Italy, which is quite amusing, is about this favorite of um, Maria de' Medici, who was his main minister, Marshal Concini. And he was a favorite of Maria de' Medici, but not of her son. Louis XIII was very young, but who was jealous of this guy who was lover and minister and everything. So he organized that he is assassinated. He could not you know, confront his mother, who was his regent, openly, so he just arranged for two other people to assassinate him, which eventually happened in the Cour de Louvre, the royal palace. And when they assassinated him, they found in Concini's pockets credit letters for extraordinary amount of money, money that even with all the favors bestowed on him, he could have not afforded. And what do you think happened next? Louis simply changed the name on these credit letters and passed them on the two killers of Concini without inquiring where the money come from or whatever. This is very, very much how anti-corruption worked under autocratic monarchs. It was always fairly bloody when you lost favor or when people who were on top changed what was allowed until then, which was simply getting a commission to intermediate favors of the monarch was no longer allowed and this is what happened. However, what is interesting is that European monarchy evolved fairly well with the ex notable exception of Russia. And we find in the absolute to constitutional evolution quite a remarkable development of bureaucracy and transition. And I'm looking today and I find today that the longest enduring monarchies actually had very successful traditions from transitions from patrimonialism. Some of the best governed countries in the world today are constitutional monarchies. I don't know if you're aware of this. So actually a third of the world best governed countries are traditional monarchies and two thirds out of present monarchies not constitutional but every, every monarchies rank in the top category of good governance in the world. So something about tradition changing gradually rather than opening the door to newcomers who start spoiling seems to be here. Then you know that there is also Person and Abellini and other people who found these positive effects of constitutional monarchy. So if we look at pluralism and corruption, how it looks, it looks a little bit like that. What you see there plotted are, of course, countries. You see that once a country becomes a little bit more democratic or more plural, in fact, corruption increases a little bit. Why? Because simply there are more groups who try to spoil the state. The number of people who try to exceed the spoils is greater. But the rule of the game is still spoiling. Whoever comes to government tries to spoil. And then gradually and slowly it starts getting down the more a country is older. But my research proves that it doesn't get down due to democracy, I mean due to elections, but it gets down simply because normative constraints increase, because the number of people able to put up opposition to the system through some form of collective action increases. The second system that I look at, so this first was monarchy. The second is this elite republicanism, and I'm going to explain why am I interested in that. So I look at European city-states, and of course, in particular in Italy. What you see there, of course, is the very nice picture from the Siena City Hall that you might recall, the Siena during the nine, right, when treaties of good governance were, were written. So this is really medieval and early Renaissance Italy which was very concerned with good governance and which was Republican. It was Republican in its own way, which meant that only people who were citizens were part of this collective system of government and who was not a part of this was not an equal citizen. But some form of representation existed even for, for these people. And I describe in this paper this rather extraordinary institutions of these monarchies, which were based on basically civic duty. Everything which was controlled was civic duty. People were conscripted to collect tax. You had a limited mandate. You collected tax for just, let's say, three months for all your, from all your neighbors. Other neighbors were conscripted to check you when collecting tax. So the whole system was based on very high distrust, was based on the very good notion, speaking as a psychologist, that in fact the human nature is sectarian, that people are indeed utility maximizers and will profit of any opportunity from taking out of the common till for, for themselves. So the whole system was very much prevention geared. It was 
trying to deny you the opportunities where you could make use of this. And these systems were highly successful, in my opinion. Some historians disagree, but I believe they were, they were financially highly successful when their end came of simply, you know, bigger armies invading Italy. And they were also politically very successful. I give a lot of examples in the paper, so I won't, I won't stay on this. And they were clearly defined as anti-particularist system. Hence, the fact that uh, the government of the city was entrusted to a podesta, a person who was selected from outside the city, so he is, doesn't know anyone and he's not related to any faction in the city. And he came with his own apparatus, with police enforcement, with judges, with everything. There was a market for such people who were specialized, and he was only paid his salary at the very end, after all his accounts were checked, and after he was eventually fined for poor uh, governance. And then at the end, they would give him his, his money and he would go. There was this uh, you know, nice rule in Genoese colonies that uh, the Genoese governor could not stay more than one year. Term was limited to one year. And he was supposed to leave by the same boat who, bought his, who brought his successor. <laughs> so they could only you know, meet and go. All right, and finally we come to, to modern democracy, where the principle, returning to, to Susan's principal idea. Okay, so it's clear who the principal is right in an autocracy. It's the monarch. The monarch is the principal. If he's an autocratic monarch, he just kills his favorites when, uh, when he suspects them they're no longer loyal. If he's a constitutional monarch, or he's, if he's an enlightened despot, uh, then he, like the king of Denmark, in my paper, like the king of, he's trying to create a bureaucracy. Why? In order to, to, to get more money out of his aristocracy or to get more money from whoever he needs to pay taxes because we are no longer in feudalism. He needs taxes to fund his wars or whatever. In elite republicanism, principles is everyone who is a citizen. And therefore, citizenship is very clearly controlled. All of us, and in the same time, we have to take care to, uh, to create a surveillance system for all of us. Finally, in the modern democracy, the principle disappears. The principle becomes very unclear and diffuse and disempowered. Both prevention and repression are entrusted to these agents, bureaucrats. But it's not really clear to whom these agents are, in fact, loyal. If franchise and party factionalism, in fact, I find, precedes creation of a strong bureaucracy, and this is the situation of most countries, except France and United States, then control of corruption simply doesn't get built. Why is that? Because politicization of bureaucracy and politicization of magistracy are very strong. When you have re regime by parties and there is really nothing to oppose parties, there is not a monarch there who has some continuity, and basically, there is nothing else. Then it's really very complicated. And if you look at the American or French history, which are both a source of encouragement for developing countries, because these were countries which operated in far more difficult conditions than Denmark or Sweden. But it are also countries to whom it took quite a lot of time to get there. If you look at politicization of French uh, system, I quote some figures from Rossin Vallon, who says that not even in the 70s, you know, they were still controlling quite a big amount of things. And in the United States, you know, it took decades to start politicization of government and to start having some merit-based bureaucracy. Okay, so how was control of corruption reached in my historical case studies? Well, this explains why we don't manage to reach it so well yet, yet, you know, today. Ombudsman, now we have over 140 ombudsmen in the world or something. It's an extraordinary figure, everybody adopts them. But in many countries they don't work. The reason they don't work is that in the past the ombudsman was a tool for political opposition. So you actually gave the ombudsman to whom? To the opposition who had the interest to use it against you, to, to censor the government behavior. Today we entrust the ombudsman in many of these countries to governments, okay? Government Governments are not going to censor themselves. This is not how, how it worked historically. Merit-based system were introduced only as part of need in the European history, in the army-navy first. Why? Because these incompetent aristocrats just appointed out of nepotism were losing wars. And then the idea came, I mean, let's hire somebody who knows what this is about. 
control and audit system was introduced by monarchs as part of conflict with aristocracy, so it simply came out of conflict as a need to, to construct this. Normative constraint was responsible for extension pluralism, and we find very strong collective action. Even in the example that uh, James Robinson gives in his book on economic basis of uh, dictatorship and democracy, he very much neglects the fact that it was very strong, popular feeling in Britain for extending franchise, which was very much based on the revolution across the channel. People are emulating revolution. Blacklists existed with people who voted against the extension of franchise. So in fact, whenever some progress was made, whenever institutions change, we find this collective action element present. Same with media. So basically, the transition from corrupt regimes to a regime where ethical universalism is the norm, I argue in the paper, is a political and not a technical legal process. So this process can only be a domestic progress. We can perhaps assist it, but it's not us outsiders who are going to move a country from patrimonialism to ethical universalism. OK, I come to my three essential questions, and then I'm done. Where to do something? Where to act, right? And of course, it's obviously that we have these two categories of countries that I told you about today. 80 of them hold elections, and they're very corrupt. And about 40 of them don't hold any elections, and they're very corrupt. They're the classic neo-patrimonial countries. Now, what you see here in green and in red, they're very small. They're countries. I don't know if you managed to see anything. It's basically, you've seen twice this today. But I just put it in a form which, which can make us come up to, with some recommendations as well. This is the correlation between Human Development Index and control of corruption that you have seen at both Wu and Susan Rose Ackerman. But if you have noticed in Wu's graphs, this only explains 0.47% of variance, which means that roughly half the countries of the world are not perfectly explained in terms of modernization link with governance. There are also other factors there. And what you see here are some of these countries which are the least explained by their modernization level. Countries in green are countries which are doing far better than their modernization. In other words, their poverty, education, and life expectancy would predict. And countries in red are countries which are doing far worse. And if you would look, you see that some Scandinavian countries are actually absolutely exceeding their level from afar. They're doing far better than they should. So there must be something else than development making these countries doing well. Also, you see that Russia, China, some Central Asian countries, some Caucasian countries are actually very poor performers. They're absolutely underperformers. They should have better governance seeing the equipment, the modernization equipment that they have. And this already allows you to place a country somewhere and realize if a country has initial conditions or not. And my advocacy is, of course, that we should try to act, or people should try to act, in countries which have this sort of equipment, but they're doing so badly. So then when to do something is question number one. Who should do something? Let's not take the principle for granted, but that means we have to find a principle. You have to find a person or an alliance where to ground your reforms. And therefore, I think we should put the who before the what. And if we cannot answer meaningfully this who question, who has his best interest to change the status quo in a country, then there's not much we can do. So the democratic path, I think the solution is to empower the permanent losers out of corruption arrangements. It sounds very logical, but it's very difficult to do in practice. Because these permanent losers are the disfranchised, are the powerless, are the poorest, and so forth, right? So we have first situation, you have losers from corruption, people lose. Whoever comes to government, there are people who lose, and we know this. We put a survey question where we ask people, same people have privileges regardless of who wins elections. And we have huge majorities in many countries around the world where you have 70, 80% people saying, yes, same people have privileges, democracy doesn't help. OK, let's say you have these people. So they are the principles. And any strategy should be grounded at their level. You have to somehow create alliances out of these people. Situation B, you have losers, but they're not autonomous enough for action. 
then you do not do any anti-corruption. That is my opinion. You as a donor, you simply should not do it. It's immoral. You will give some strong anti-corruption agency to someone who will just use it politically to arrest their opponents and they don't do anything. But in fact, you invest in a group which is capable to inflict some normative constraints in the future. Whatever that group might be, you know, fighting through internet, watchdog media, so whatever. And I call this, it's, so it's more like investing into civil society development. Finally, you have situation G, C. No significant domestic losers exist from corruption. Could this exist? I mean, are public resources so unlimited that you do not have any losers? Well, it does exist, because some countries have natural resources, and they simply use them very well. You know, Mr. Putin pays the gas utility for basically every Russian household. So people vote for them. They don't feel they're losing, they're actually winning, right? In Qatar, I just read a nice paper about Qatar. All Qatar citizens have extraordinary right. You know, they have right to free education, they have right to free housing. Who, who does all the work and doesn't have any rights? All the foreign workers who are the majority there, right? So you have situations where actually you do not have opposition. And those situations, of course, you shouldn't do any anti-corruption. That's ridiculous. And that's my last path. So there are actually two ways, right? I frequently get asked about authoritarian countries. The authoritarian traditional path is it possible through this path to achieve good governance? Yes, it is. You know, you have countries like Botswana where the would-be king becomes the first democratic president. You have Bhutan, which is a monarchy. It's in green on the Red World Bank side. It does extraordinarily well. You have Qatar, you have Rwanda. You know, all these countries are in the green in World Bank, even if I dispute that they're so they're doing so well. But still, they're doing remarkably well. But that's not much that we scientists can do about it, because actually it comes down to the question. Can you turn a bad and incompetent despot into an enlightened one? And then this path works, because there is a recipe what enlightened despots did, like the King of Denmark, to, uh, to move their countries forward. But where I think we should work and where I think we should put our efforts is on the democratic path. On the democratic path, I think that what we should do, we should do more anti-corruption type two, what I call it, this horizontal and social accountability, this prevention mechanism based on peers. We, how can we do this since we do not have city states? Well, we can do it by getting to smaller sizes, by bounding them well, that's I explained very much in the papers not trying to solve the whole country, but cutting the problem into pieces. And there are organizations who do this, organizations who do anti-corruption as part of development, right? And who create anti-corruption components of development programs. Let's say you do a school. Actually, there was some example today about the, the parents in Uganda who now supervise school budgets, right? Or you do an oversight committee of people in whose community you are going to build as a developer. This is the kind of, of things which I think work. And what these communities do? Well, they solve classic collective action problem. You do more monitoring, but you do monitoring like my Italian cities. You do monitoring by people who stand directly to lose if the money are lost, not by agencies, not by bureaucrats, not by people whom you hire, train, and the rest. And a little bit less repression. Repression really doesn't work in, in these climates. Gets, and uh, a little bit uh, also uh, less... Uh, awareness uh, campaigns and something. People know very well, they don't need to tell us. And just to end, the, you know, we used to have a Soviet joke about the importance of, of context, of understanding anything. If you're a Soviet scholar, you'll know it and hear it before. It was about this car factory which produced Lada cars. And the rumor was it that everybody was stealing in the factory. Since it was collective property, there was nobody, right? And the stealing was so bad that it was reputed that for each car coming out of the factory in, you know, as a whole car, in parts, in people's pockets or bags or whatever, two other cars were leaving the factory. That was very much the rate. And the anecdote says that there was this man who every day when the workers exit the factory, who was coming out pushing a wheel, an empty wheelbarrow, or looked like an empty wheelbarrow. And the guards at the, at the exit every day they tried to control him rigorously. They turned the wheelbarrow down. They knocked it on all parts to find out if the guy had put some spare parts everywhere. You know, and they couldn't find anything. You know, one day, two days, three days. Well, do you think the guy was stealing or not? Who thinks he's stealing? Well, what, what, what was he stealing, the two people? Wheelbarrows. Wheelbarrows, obviously. <laughs> OK. So context matters a lot to interpret corruption situations. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. So now we'll hear from Michael Johnston. He's the Charles Dana Professor of Political Science at Colgate University. He teaches American and comparative politics, development, democratization, civil society issues, and his research specialization, not surprisingly, is the study of corruption and reform. Um, he, uh, he has a book coming out uh, next month, yep. is that right? Mm -hmm. On corruption, contention, and reform. Um, so I think he, he, his book is about why we fight with each other over corruption. So looking forward very much to hearing his comments here today. Great. Well, thank you very much. And like the other speakers, I just want to say what uh, really what a thrill it is to be here and to uh, see this kind of uh, crowd and to hear the uh, quality of of questions that uh, have been going back and forth, it, uh, is, it really is a privilege. I was a little uh, bemused to uh, hear Alina talking about a uh, degree in 1996 as a long time ago. Um, this uh, white here is honestly come by, and um, I, in fact, did my first uh, cor work on corruption, I think it was, in 1974 or something like that, which means I was inspired by the Nixon administration, a phrase you don't often get to use, and uh, <laughs> was also um, the aftermath of a little episode in a local election in New Haven where I almost became the bagman for an illegal campaign contribution. Um, almost. So uh, we'll, we'll keep it at that, but uh, I think that has made me a little, uh, uh, little careful about uh, uh, blaming and judging other people as well. Now let me see if I can go back to the to the very beginning here because I've been accidentally punching buttons. Very good. Um, okay, I think a, a fair amount of what I've got to say uh, will overlap some of Alina's uh, excellent points, and I'll try not to uh, repeat them uh, too directly. But I want to um, take a look at this uh, corruption, reform, democracy nexus in somewhat more detail because it's very tantalizing, and at the same time. Uh, poses a variety of riddles and puzzles for us. Uh, most apparently low corruption countries are democracies, and if you uh, look at the, the tail on that graph, and I use a variation on that graph too, you see uh, the Scandinavian countries, and you see you know, the United States, and you see Canada, a variety of others. But not all of the low corruption countries are democracies, and not all democracies control corruption very well. And in addition, it's pretty clear democracy brings corruption problems of its own. And uh, that's something I think we need to say, to say more about and think more about. We get a kind of a pass from many of the international corruption indices, and that's, that's maybe partly because of the uh, difficulties in the indices, though generally I think they're, they're quite useful. But it's also because a lot of the corruption issues uh, in countries such as this one are embedded in the law. They are embedded in accepted processes. They are embedded in the you know, sort of standard operating procedures of, uh, of democratic uh, politics. They are, as Lawrence Lessig puts it, sometimes institutionalized corruption or institutional corruption. Many times uh, they, they are legal, and often they are desirable activities pushed to an extreme. Think about lobbying, um, kind of a dirty word. It's really the exercise of First Amendment rights. And yet, when lobbying gets pushed beyond an ill-defined point on which there's very little agreement and a lot of political controversy, it falls over into the realm um, of uh, corruption. Uh, the thing that most bothers most citizens in American politics today is the role of money in politics. I, I think I can make a, at least a half decent case that allowing citizens up to a point to express the intensity of their views by adding some money to the process um, is not only permissible, maybe it's a good thing, but again, beyond some point. And again, it's a controversial point, but when you push that uh, process beyond some point, it becomes um, pretty clearly corrupt in the eyes of most citizens, even though the overwhelming majority of money, in our system at least, is raised and spent and, and the like um, within, the, uh, within the legal system. Um, we have in a uh, country like this one or in many of the market democracies a kind of corruption or a syndrome that I call influence markets. And it's tempting to look at that and say, well, these are prosperous countries. This must be corruption light, maybe something not to worry about. Um, in fact, I think it's worth worrying about a great deal, especially in the, the global arena. Um, if you think about it in this way, a lot of other kinds of corruption re 
revolve mostly around exploiting a particular state in a particular place. Many of the mechanisms of influence market corruption have a way of spreading out into the marketplace, have a way of spreading out into the global system. If you want to understand the, uh, you know, John Heilbrunn has shown us, if you want to understand corruption in Equatorial Guinea, you need to start in Paris um, in many ways. And uh, yet the uh, corruption that goes on in Equatorial Guinea will get chalked up to the latter country uh, rather more than it does to France. And so there is this sense of influence markets that they do have real global implications. At the same time, a lot of basic uh, democratic ideas or ideals are central to reform. Accountability, limits on power, uh, the rule of law, a voice and role for citizens. And so in a way, my paper is uh, asking the question, what is it about democracy that might and might not uh, aid the, course, uh, aid the uh, cause of corruption control? And I offer two arguments, and the point one really is where the, the book that's coming out next month begins, um, and I uh, go on and speculate on it, I suppose, at truly excessive length. But that point is this, that corruption will persist and will even be the norm, be one of those 120 countries, until the people with a stake in ending it can oppose it in ways that cannot be ignored. Now, what that means, if I'm right, is that reform is going to be a contentious process. It isn't going to be a search for civic virtue. It isn't going to be a search for public goods, for good government for all, only. It's going to be some of those things, but ultimately it has to be driven by people's real and lasting interests, has to be driven by contention revolving around those interests. And bringing those interests out, bringing them to the table, is a process that I call deep democratization. It's not the same thing as democracy up and running. As a matter of fact, I argue that the established democracies, this one included, have a lot of work yet to do to make democracy really, truly, you know, deeply democratic. There is an old, old conception of corruption, Patrick Dobell has written about this a long time ago, uh, that derives from, uh, from the Greeks, that sees corruption not as a property of an action or a person, but as a characteristic of an entire society and that a society falls into a state of corruption when its leaders lose the capacity to inspire loyalty, when its system loses the capacity to inspire the allegiance of citizens. And I think when you look not, at, not just at the US, but when you look at many democracies around the world and you see very solid majorities saying again and again, my leaders don't care about me, money dominates the process, uh, Alina's question about elections don't make a difference, that's what we're seeing. That's a corruption problem and it's one that we need to think more about. The second argument that I want to offer is on a somewhat different level, but that is whatever the virtues of democratization, the way we recognize most democracies is elections, and while we would wish it were otherwise, we cannot depend upon voters to punish the corrupt leaders and officials at the polls. It's not to say it never happens, but uh, making that sort of uh, you know, job number one in checking uh, corruption is going to be uh, a difficult process. A quick tour through, through both of those points. The paper goes into um, um, all of these, I think, in somewhat more detail. Deep, democra deep democratization is not the equivalent of democracy in a formal institutional sense. It's rather a, fundamentally, a fundamental opening up of the processes of making rules and decisions. If you follow the work of Asimolu and Robinson, Why Nations Fail, um, their argument about um, extractive and inclusive regimes is a very similar uh, and powerful kind of argument. And they've got a number of, of cases they talk about in which regimes governed better as they became more inclusive. They did that because they had to. They did that because there were people prepared to act against them if they, um, if they did not. So bringing more interests and voices to the table. Um, it's not necessarily motivated by civic ideals or grand principles. Um, more often it will be driven by people saying, you know, look, I'm, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm tired of having my land taken. I'm tired of having my business uh, seized. I'm tired of having my rights abused. I'm sick and tired. And those kinds of interests are the interests, it seems to me, that are going to overcome collective action problems and help to sustain reform movements over the long term. 
That process will be contentious. Um, it will often, in the process of contention, give rise to a number of ideals. If you look at the uh, um, impeachments of the Stuart's, uh, uh, Stuart Monarch's uh, uh, counselors in the 17th century in England, some really important really recognizably modern ideas about accountability and limits on power emerged from those political fights. Uh, but they, you know, and while corruption furnished the vocabulary of those fights, those ideals emerged not as schemes for better government. They were clubs to use to swing at the other guys. They were, they were, they were ideas that were useful uh, for uh, strategic and uh, tactical kinds of uh, kinds of reasons. So reform will often be more contentious, more disorderly uh, than we might wish. Uh, the goal is to reach political settlements that become institutionalized, um, not because they're ideal, not because they're best practices, but because they work for enough people enough of the time to protect their interests and to engage their, their loyalty, to engage their um, obedience. So those, some, those settlements sometimes come out of what I would call useful stalemates. Uh, you know, people have decided conflict is too much to continue. Let's make a few rules. Let's see if we can live with them. In a variety of cases, deep democratization means to take a good close look at the real competitiveness of politics. I mean, we like to think of our political parties in the U.S. as, as competing tooth and nail. Um, in actual fact, they don't. Uh, as I like to uh, talk about with my students, in most uh, congressional ele elections, about 360 or 375 uh, members of the House are running for re-election. How many of them are defeated? Usually about five, you know, the Tea Party year being an exception. How many of those elections are decided by 2% or less? Usually about a dozen out of 360 or so. You have a situation in which the two political parties hunker down in their own sort of gerrymandered bailiwicks and they actually compete as little as possible. That's, that's not, a, not a very promising kind of uh, recipe. We need to look more closely at what Lawrence Lessig calls institutional corruption. Um, we need to look at the way in which uh, legalized private sector rents uh, accomplish goods, uh, accomplish goals and enrich people in ways that would be thought corrupt in many other kinds of circumstances. Uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz's uh, work on inequality brings this out. Uh, we need to look at collusion among established parties and interests. Uh, we use political finance rules often to try try to drive money out of the process unsuccessfully, I think we ought to use them to try to enhance participation. I think we ought to use them to try to enhance competition uh, to build a system that people can trust because perhaps they see their votes actually making a difference. Um, now I think most people do not. And in particular, we need to take a look at our mechanisms of transparency and accountability, which in democratic societies are all too often reduced to ritual, are all too often co-opted from, at times built or rebuilt by the people at the top and used more as a mechanism of control than as anything resembling accountability, as anything resembling transparency. In other words, I think um, as we try to deal with corruption around the world, we need to take a good uh, long look in the mirror. None of that is the answer, um, but the common denominator among these various ideas is this, that you know, quite, quite often we have gone into societies, and I say we because I've been personally involved in it, and we have a grand strategy. And we say, let's get civil society behind the strategy. Let's get people uh, behind the strategy. Well, why don't we choose our reforms in such a way as they aid those people's ability to advance their own interests, to advance their own grievances, to, you know, if we're going to talk about what to do in Egypt, look at the way in which people fear the police and get after the police partly for being corrupt and partly for being coercive and brutally repressive. Um, you know, if we're looking at election uh, fraud in uh, established democracies, let's not just control the, uh, the money. That's like trying to defeat illegal gambling by arresting the horses. Instead, you know, why don't we try to enhance competition? Why don't we try to enhance participation? So that is uh, a kind of a quick summary of the deep democratization argument. 
The second theme in the paper, voting the scoundrels out, that was a popular uh, theme right here in New York City during the age of uh, Tammany Hall, um, during the uh, reform era. Um, and sometimes it does happen. The Tangentopoli uh, scandal in Italy basically obliterated the entire Italian party system, save for, for the communists. Uh, the post-Watergate election of 1974 being another example of lots of uh, would-be or perceived scoundrels um, being voted out. But those cases are distressingly rare, and what's more, we also know from experience the scoundrels have a way of coming back in two years or four years, and suddenly it's the same old bunch sitting back uh, right where they had been, uh, right where they had been before. Voting the scoundrels out, it's made difficult by, you know, the whole question of what is and is not corrupt. corrupt. Is there any kind of consensus over some things? Yes. Over a much broader penumbra of activities? No. Uh, a lot of our judgments are conditional and equivocal. Um, people don't mean the same thing when they talk about corruption. And of course, it's almost always you guys over there and uh, you know, not, uh, not our side in the uh, election process. A lot of it doesn't come to light or it's reported belatedly. Uh, journalistic reports are superficial and sensationalistic. Tiny stuff gets as much play as the you know, really big and damaging scandals, at least in many uh, uh, American news outlets, uh, and in part because maybe perhaps they involve some high-level personalities and the like. Um, one of the notions of campaign finance reform was that we would be able to punish the, the bad guys at the polls based on data on political money. Well, there's such a, a tidal wave of, of data. and. Um, you know, processing that it takes a long time. It is something that is likely to come to light if there, if it does ever at all, um, several years after the fact. Um, by that point, people have moved on. A lot of voters place relatively little faith in electoral processes to begin with. Uh, the real scandal, uh, scoundrels may not be on the ballot. Um, many citizens may have a stake in corruption. You know, I've been getting uh, little goodies from the political boss down, down at the corner, and you know, why should I put that at risk, especially if I don't trust others to do so as well? Or I may just think that as bad as the status quo is, shaking it up is perhaps going to make things even worse. And one of the things about anti-corruption appeals in many countries around the world is that people have heard it before. You know, and they've, they've seen results that are not always all, not always all that wonderful. Um, at times, a culture of corruption, you know, can take root. And here I will look not at the developing world, but I'll look at Oklahoma. About 25 years ago, there was a county commissioners scandal in which it turned out that about two-thirds of the county commissioners, powerful officials in Oklahoma, were using public work crews and materials to pave their friends' driveways and build swimming pools for them and the like. Federal government came in and indicted about two thirds of the state's uh, county commissioners for that. And among a lot of people in Oklahoma, the result, uh, the reaction was, you know, what? That's what we've always done. You know, that's what we elect these guys to do is to, you know, pave our driveways. Um, that sort of culture of corruption can arise in perhaps some surprising places. Um, Electoral rules, structures matter. In federal systems, uh, outrage can be misplaced. Uh, the national administration uh, often gets the uh, highest distrust levels in the United States. I would argue that probably state and local governments are at least equally corrupt and in some places uh, much more so. In a parliamentary system, if they, if they mess up at the cabinet level, do you vote for, the, you know, for the, the candidates in your local constituency in such a way as to party, uh, punish the party leadership? That might not seem to work. In European-style systems, anti-establishment parties uh, proliferate, but they rarely have a serious anti-corruption kind of an agenda. And if they do get a share of power, their, their, power, tends to, uh, their ten power tends to fade away. Um, what to do? You know, there's really no answer to this looked at one way because these are not problems in the electoral process to be fixed. They are the electoral process. 
you know, and we like that and we want to keep that. But I think we need to think about ways of emphasizing real openness and competition and accountability, not only in the countries we're out there trying to assist with their corruption problems, but, uh, but perhaps right here at home. Uh, I would like to see regular publication and benchmarking of government performance uh, indicators. That's a way, I think, perhaps to measure the problem and what's more to locate it and to find out what to do about it and to build a sense among people that uh, the government can or cannot do something. Better training of journalists, um, re-examining our electoral laws and so forth. Um, looking at expectations as a measure of, uh, of progress. Uh, do people trust the system? Do people trust the electoral process? Do they participate in it and so forth? Changing those expectations over a period of time is of the essence. And that's why the perception index is valuable, because perceptions shape expectations and expectations shape behavior. None of these ideas is a fix. None of them is a panacea. In fact, I've never heard anyone get up and say, this is, in fact, a panacea. That doesn't happen. Uh, but what they are are ideas that may open the door for us and for citizens in other places to demand that the system do better. Um, difficult as it is to do so through the electoral process, it has to be an all-day, every-day kind of an enterprise in which we're willing to engage. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you. Um, I, I felt like you were going to call us to the barricades. You had a, a moment there. You said, corruption will continue until those who have a stake in India, ending it oppose it in ways that cannot be ignored. So uh, I'd be interested to hear in the Q&A what that actually means in practice. I mean, don't leave it all to Peter Eigen. It's our job, too. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, our last uh, presentation today is Sheila Krumholtz. She's the Center for Responsive Politics Executive Director. She became, <laughs> you have a fan, probably many of them, including myself. Um, she became Executive Director in 2006, having served for eight years as the Center's Research Director, in which capacity she supervised data analysis for opensecrets.org. And she first joined the Center in 1989, and has since then served as the editor of the first edition of Open Secrets, the center's flagship publication. In 2010, Fast Company magazine named Sheila one of its most influential women in technology list. So, Sheila, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all, and to the Center for Public Scholarship and the New School in Ariane. Uh, I am the least technically oriented of the women in that Fast Company <laughs> magazine <laughs> article. But anyway, um, so the uh, I'm glad to see or hear some of you are familiar with the Center and Open Secrets. Uh, we're a nonpartisan, staunchly nonpartisan research organization that tracks money in U.S. politics. Uh, we're we're non-breathless, we think, we hope. We're non-bomb throwing. We're not they're very sexy, but we think we are um, credible and authoritative source on money in, in politics, and you can find us, of, of course, on opensecrets.org, um, because, of course, money's ability to exert sometimes disproportionate influence over policy and politics is an open secret in Washington and far, far beyond the D.C. Beltway. Uh, we've been following, uh, and I should state for the record, for the, for the record, um, this is going to be something completely different because I'm not a scholar, so I'm simply here to present kind of who we are and what we do and the money in the last election and what we've seen uh, over time. Uh, we've been following the money for 30 years now, and in that time, our researchers have compiled and curated the nation's most comprehensive set of data and analysis on campaign contributions, which has long been our bailiwick, but also on campaign expenditures, how that money is spent, who are the beneficiaries, the vendors, uh, that benefit from the campaign industrial complex uh, in the Washington area. We also track lobbying and uh, the revolving door, which keeps lobbying firms stocked with high value former members and, and connected staffers from government. And we create and publish data on personal finance, finances of members of Congress and key government officials. All this data is freely available. You can download all the bulk data, the archival data back uh, 25 years on Open Secrets in order to make good on the promise that public records are indeed the public's records and need to be, and that access to that needs to be real and meaningful. That it is not just the people's business, but in fact their obligation to find and use all pertinent information uh, available to them to inform themselves 
in order to better hold their representatives and their government accountable for what is being done in their name. The connection to corruption, of course, is clear. When conflicts of interest abound, as they do when private money fills the coffers of public servants, the opportunities for rent seeking and even quid pro quo corruption and bribery are there. When the public is unaware of or unable to effectively monitor these relationships, the appetite for risking legal and political liabilities grows. So who's giving how much to whom? Let's start with a big picture view and then dive into the details. CRP has calculated that the total cost of the most recent federal elections, the 2012 cycle, was at least $6.3 billion. This is based on data showing that while the presidential campaign spending was actually down compared to 2008, the outside spending was way up, as you might expect post Citizens United, especially for independent expenditures by non-party groups in 2012 compared to all previous cycles spending soars. This chart gives us a comparison over the last 16 years or eight cycles, and as you can see, there's always two step forward, one step back quality to federal election spending because of the extraordinary resources that are expended every uh, presidential election cycle. But over time, you see a continued growth with 70%, a 70 percent increase from 2000 to 2008 alone. And in 2012, of course, we hit the $6.3 billion mark. That's a 23 percent increase over 2008, 111 increase over the prior decade. And this is just what's reported. So I, there is a lot of talk about what the true number is. This is just what we can measure. and. Um, and I should say, in addition to this, we are compiling data about uh, uh, contributions from nonprofits to nonprofits. Uh, so uh, this is at least kind of the baseline. Where is that money coming from? The primary value that CRP brings to this work is not only to aggregate it uh, in one place, but to aggregate it by industry and interest groups so that we can say, uh, both for campaign contributions as well as lobbying, and this allows us to ask, where does this money come from? Far and away and consistently over time, most of the itemized money that we can examine, that is contributions of more than $200, come from political action committees and individuals representing corporate interests, and at times directly from the corporations themselves. This chart aggregates contributions to candidates, parties, super PACs, and other outside spending groups over the last decade plus, and shows the stark contrast. And to explain a little bit about our methodology, we look at business versus labor, ideological, and other uh, organizations, other mostly being retired individuals. And then within that, we um, have increasing uh, uh, levels of granularity. So we have uh, 13 sectors, 100 industries, 400 categories, so that we can get down to say how much came from sugar barons, how much came from tobacco interests. Uh, but even uh, uh, among PACs, the favored means of delivering funds in elections, business still has a more than five to one uh, fundraising advantage over labor unions. And whatever slice you look at, business interests dominate with an overall advantage over organized labor of about 15 to one. And of course, I have to raise this caveat. Everybody works for somebody if they work. Uh, so this, by necessity, will overestimate uh, business and underestimate labor because uh, donors need not identify their labor affiliation, but only their occupation employer. Which sector of industry gives most of the money? The one that has the money to give. Wall Street, banks, insurance. Cycle after cycle, the finance, insurance, and real estate, or FIRE, sector is the biggest donor of campaign cash to candidates, PACs, and parties in the USA. And who do they give it to? Incumbents, but especially the members of Congress who have jurisdiction over their industries, companies, and issues based on their congressional committee assignments. Here's the House Financial Services money profile so far this year and the proportion of its money that comes from the finance, insurance, and real estate sector in the middle. And speaking of anomalies, whenever you have time, check out our anomalies tracker. Uh, which you can find under resources on Open Secrets. That's where we're serving up uh, interesting tidbits such as lawmakers' ultra donors, donors that give a politician twice as much as their next highest donor, or my favorite lawmakers uh, sponsoring legislation that was lobbied on by only one company whose employees or PAC also contributed and is a major donor, a top donor, to that very same uh, lawmaker. Don Young. Uh, sponsored H.R. 39, the Polar Bear Delisting Act, removing polar bears from the endangered species list. And uh, the only group to lobby on that bill was Safari International, which is a top donor to Don Young and presumably wants to shoot those polar bears. Mm -hmm. One last one. Anyone remember which Uber lobbyist 
sorry, that was the anomaly tracker. Anyone remember which Uber lobbyist turned jailbird turned best-selling author worked for Greenberg Traurig a decade ago? In 2003, Jack Abramoff's Indian tribe clients were four out of the top five of the entire firm's top clients. So these are the kinds of things that when you dig into the details, pop up and, and make you kind of sit up and take notice. Do these outliers prove anything? An improper relationship? Not necessarily, not on their own, but they offer a money trail uh, that may point to a specific payoff or just may explain how the money in Washington work. Uh, and we'd love, actually, uh, this is a great audience for this, we'd love to have ideas for more of those kinds of anomalies. Uh, here I show the big picture of reported outside spending, showing the super PACs accounted for almost half of the outside money reported to the Federal Election Commission. 50 party committees and three times as many 501c4 social welfare organizations are nearly tied as the next highest source of spending on independent expenditures and electioneering communications, with both at just over a quarter billion dollars. All told, more than 800 groups reported spending nearly $1.3 billion to influence the 2012 elections. Similarly, this provides a visual of the changing landscape over the past decade and by type of group. It shows the scale as 527 committees in red and unions in purple rose and fell compared to the 501c4s in green, which spiked in 2012, though it's obviously dwarfed by the even larger growth in super PAC spending. And when we look at this spending by target, you can see a massive onslaught uh, against, and sometimes for, candidates in specific races. So the color bar at the top gives you the at-a-glance view. Blue is presidential, green is Senate, gold is House. And specifically, the, in Congress, the top targets were, for instance, the Virginia Senate race, with 52 million spent by outside groups, mostly against Tim Kaine. Even the candidates, altogether, only spent $34 million. Uh, the other top targets were the other hot Senate races, Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, where Luger lost and, uh, and uh, Richard Murdoch nearly won. This year, the top target so far was the Marquis Gomez race in Massachusetts to replace John Kerry, where $8.2 million was spent so far, the big money coming from out of state, or some of the big money. Uh, more importantly, and partly as a consequence, winning candidates had to spend an average of $1.5 million uh, in the House and $11.4 million in the Senate, in part to withstand the barrage of ads and other spending that all of this uh, super PAC and nonprofit money buys. I'm not going to dwell on the presidential race. Uh, seems so long ago and far away now. But um, the big difference uh, there, I think, was the outside money. Uh, again, the overall spending by the candidates was less, uh, despite the fact that um, we always see money going up, up, up. Uh, you know, the 2008 race really was so extraordinary. It was such a wide open field. So, uh, so the story this time really was the outside spending. It was 12% of the overall money for the Obama campaign, but nearly 34% of the Romney campaign. And uh, overall, it just makes up a larger portion of the funds this time. And the significance, significance of that uh, is that the important sources of funding for everyone shrunk yet again. A very small number of people and, institu and institutions provided or raised the outside money. How was the money spent? Looking at just reported outside spending by cycle, we see also see dramatic growth and just how central independent expenditures, the ads we were barraged with, have become compared to electioneering and communication costs. Uh, so, you know, uh, gradual increase from 2004 and then exploding in 2012. And this is what it looks like so far this year compared to even last cycle. Uh, so, again, more of the same story. Here's another more conservative and arguably more consistent way to look at that outside spending. When you include all the other kinds of outside money that were prevalent in years past, you see more continuity over time. The purple bars represent national party soft money spending, and you can see that grow through the 90s, and especially in 2000 and 2002, the last call at the soft money bar um, before McCain-Feingold kicked in. And then the outside activity shifts to federally focused 527s. You may remember them from the 2004 campaign. Anyone remember a particularly successful 527 from the 2004 campaign? Anyone? Swift Boat Veterans. Uh, after uh, a decision, uh, the decision on uh, 
there was a FEC um, decision about uh, 527s and, and specifically with regard to Swift Boat veterans. And after that uh, decision favoring uh, Swift Boat veterans, the chair of the FEC, uh, a Republican appointee, got a call from a senior staffer in the Congress saying, thank you very much. You have just handed us the election. That's what uh, he, that's what he said. Uh, the chairman. But the big story here, obviously, is still the growth in independent expenditures, starting in 2004 and then skyrocketing in 2012. And this includes the party committee money. When you take them out, the, um, the difference, the comparative increase is even larger. Uh, there's one caveat here, that uh, tiny light blue bar at the top. Uh, is uh, unreported ads referencing candidates. So these, this is our estimate based on a couple of sources, uh, and it's shown at a mere $100 million. Our estimate uh, is uh, it's very likely higher. More importantly, you should understand that this is money that has been spent not but not reported on quote unquote issue ads uh, for years, of course. It's not nothing new. Uh, but we just saw it to a higher degree in 2012. So the takeaway here is that even after all the different kinds of money from previous cycles, we still see a dramatic sp spike in spending in 2012. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, there is, I think, a real question about uh, the um, super PACs as kind of the new leadership PAC. Uh, in 2012, of the 1,300 super PACs, Registered, only about 106 were ostensibly or perhaps questionably independent single candidate super PACs, but they spent 45% of all super PAC money, or uh, a quarter billion dollars. Of these, 52 or about half were congressionally focused. And going forward, every member of Congress, every candidate even, if they uh, can find a donor to spearhead the campaign, they all have incentives now to try to encourage, even if they can't establish, the creation of these uh, single candidate um, single-minded, unrestricted spenders, raising the question, is this the new, the new breed of super PACs? Um, and more importantly, given that they rely on the same big donors and, and same staff as the campaigns, are they simply shadow candidate committees set up to evade the contribution limits? Uh, I think there's a strong argument to be made. When you look at the spending total per per targeted candidate, you can see at a glance that the largest chunk of the money was against candidates, against Democrats in pink, against Republicans in light blue. And uh, when you look at it by uh, group, there, these are the, many of the names you're well familiar with. American Crossroads at the top with 176 million, Restore Our Future, Mitt Romney's uh, Super PAC, Priorities USA, and Priorities USA Action for Obama, Majority PAC, et cetera. Uh, the important thing here, I think, is that only 40% of the <coughs> reported outside spending was fully disclosed. So by disclosure in the top right-hand pie chart, you'll see uh, that there's far more that we don't know about these uh, groups than, than we do. So voters were hamstrung. They were carpet bombed with negative, deceptive advertising, yet had one hand tied behind their backs with, uh, because the lack of disclosure meant that they couldn't consider the source about the messengers and ulterior motives that drove them to sponsor political ads. Even for registered super PACs, which are required to disclose donors, some didn't, and several used shell corporations to hide the true identity of the original donors. Uh, here we're talking about the political nonprofit spending by disclosure. And so here again you see growth not just after Citizens United, it was happening with prior court decisions, Wisconsin Right to Life uh, in 2007 in particular, and here is the result, hubs of very intricate, complicated networks of organizations that are shuffling money, not just to each other, but back and forth between each other. And this is just one little network. I don't expect you to read this. I just wanted you to see that the green circles are grantors, like the Center to Protect Patient Rights. The blue dots represent their grantees. And the orange dots represent both. And that's the churning. I was talking about. Here are the middlemen that are transferring large amounts of money back and forth among a dense network or daisy chain of secret groups. Um, so why is this all important? Because, of course, there are risks inherent in the new world order. Forty years ago, Congress was trying to combat corruption 
and prevent even just the appearance of corruption. It was concerned about the levels of financial impact that could be had by very narrow interests using campaign donations, lobbying, and the revolving door to grease the skids on their legislative agendas. In the 72 campaign, there were off-the-books activity and desperate strong-arming before the FICA, the Federal Election Campaign Act, was going to take effect, with bags of cash dropped in phone booths in Washington that creep the Nixon's committee would swoop in and pick up. They could do that because the limits and disclosure hadn't yet taken effect. So that tells you something about the nature of the relationship. The campaign was telling them, you've got to come through and you've got to do it now. And that is what the law was designed to avoid and the nature of this exchange of relation, sorry, exchange relationship. Congress tried to limit spending and failed but did put in place contribution limits and disclosure. 40 years later, continual challenges to those rules and agreeable judges have chipped away at that and shown that memories are short, strategies are long-term, and nothing is guaranteed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheila. So now, if we can, open the floor for questions. If you have a question, if you can just raise your hand, and I'll uh, point to you, and then one of our wonderful uh, helpers with a microphone will come around, right there in the corner. Hi, uh, my name's Emily Guthrie. Uh, I just completed my master's in conflict resolution at uh, Tel Aviv University, and I'm moving to Iraqi Kurdistan next month. Um, I have two questions. The first sort of pertains to um, political entities which are not fully autonomous or fully sovereign, and how, how do you fight corruption in a system where they don't have the same sort of capabilities as a fully autonomous uh, government? And the second pertains to um, increasing competition in first-past-the-post systems, um, just because it's more difficult to Berger's law and that sort of thing. Um, so how do you sort of propose to increase competition? Who would like to tackle those questions? Okay. Well, yeah, I, um, it's an excellent kind of question because um, I see the first past the post system really is one of our problems. Um, it would be interesting to talk about proportional representation in a country like this, which among other things would undercut some of the influence of uh, a number of local interests in uh, uh, many kinds of campaigns. A lot of people don't know it, but in uh, uh, state campaigns and some congressional campaigns, uh, local auto dealers are very powerful. And, you know, so when it comes time to, um, you know, rewrite the law on environmental grounds, um, you know, it's very difficult to do. PR uh, might overcome some of that, at least by bringing broader interests into, into play. I would take a very close look at, I'm, I'm going to put out a, a caveat on all of this in a moment, a very close look at gerrymandering, um, some of which is done out of the best of motives, but um, if you create one majority minority district in many parts of the country, you create five more that are almost entirely white around it, and in which uh, um, you don't really have uh, much of a political dialogue going on. Um, various aspects of incumbent advantage. Uh, when Bicro went in in 2002, putting in an all hard money uh, regime, it made life even easier for incumbents because now every single thing you legally give, if you give it to the challenger's campaign rather than outside, um, is on the record. And challengers lost ground even more to incumbents in terms of their uh, uh, fundraising ability. Now, the problem with everything thing I've mentioned is that every one of those uh, changes would have to be legislated by incumbents. And, uh, you know, they don't necessarily uh, um, you know, want to make their own lives uh, uh, more difficult. I don't know any case where they have voluntarily voted to do so. Some people see the answer to that as term limits. I think of term limits kind of as a solution in search of a problem, frankly. Um, you know, you've got term limits at the end of your arm if you want to use them. And, uh, you know, the trouble of with that is that a lot of people talk about voting the incumbents out, and I always want to ask them, can you name your incumbent? And, you know, and, and when I do ask, many people cannot. A lot of that then comes back to journalism, uh, to better coverage of politics and corruption issues. Uh, TI had a wonderful program some years ago to train journalists how to cover corruption. It was in Bangladesh. Uh, I'd like to see that in, in, you know, in many, many more countries. Um, so those are just a few kinds of, uh, um, kinds of ideas. Um, you could 
use creative matching of small uh, contributions. Michael Malbin and his uh, people at Albany have played around with what happens if you match small contributions, let's say four to one, five to one. You get a different profile in terms of where at least the, the, the core hard money comes from, and there are caveats to that as well. And you can link that with matching grants to requirements about how campaigns uh, go on. I mean, there was for a while what was called the Minnesota Compact that uh, in exchange for access to minor public funding required candidates to appear in their own adverts and to appear at debates. I think debates are overrated, but it beats a lot of the slagging that goes on. Um, you know, there are a variety of ways, I think, to maybe make the system more open, making it more competitive, uh, longer-term process. Any anyone have anything to add? Okay. Next question. Right here, Niall, woman in the black. Okay. I can just speak. This question is probably for Sheila Krumholz. Um, in the 2012 Senate election between Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown, the candidates essentially signed a agreement to uh, unilaterally disarm the People's Pledge, and it had a incredibly positive impact on the amount of negative advertising. Actually, it just went down exponentially in the sort of post-game analysis. I'm curious why you think that hasn't been a uh, mechanism replicated in other races, it had its stupendous results in Massachusetts, but we really haven't seen it elsewhere. I've always assumed that it had to do more with the nature of Massachusetts, um, but I'm. But I also feel like that's a good question for a political analyst or you know somebody who studies that more closely. I, but I, and and, and in fact, um, we are planning an event and uh, and we're hoping that we could dig into that topic specifically then. But I don't have any easy answers, and my hunch is simply that the most important factor is Massachusetts. Next questions, right here, in the front. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor PPD. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Rwanda, Bhutan, and several other countries as like um, in lower corruption index, but uh, when you talk about ethical uh, universalism, how does that really relate to? Because when you have like no human rights in those countries and having trouble with those kind of aspects, how can you consider them um, as a um, better in corruption index? Thank you. Uh, I'll be absolutely unambiguous. This was about. Uh, control of corruption based on the charts in these countries. These countries have not reached ethical universalism, none of them, nor are they close. You're perfectly right. There are countries where there is some official favoritism, and they're doing so well in charts, in World Bank charts, or in uh, con Corruption Perception Index, because the analysis, the um, individual sources which come into the segregated charts are mostly you know, bankers or economic analysts analyzing risk for business in a country. And you can very well have very low risk for business in Rwanda, but in the same time, people who are opponents of the regime, they're disappearing. All right, so I'm not promoting these countries at all, and I'm not in the business of turning autocratic despots into enlightened despots. As I said, I don't work on this, but sometimes people approach you. You know, at OECD in the spring, I was approached by an ambassador of China to I don't know what European institution, and he says, why don't you work on China? You know, I forgot to tell you that I'm actually Romanian. I was 25 when the regime changed, so I spent my first 25 years of life under Mr. Ceausescu. So I would not really voluntarily go in an, uh, in an autocratic country, give anti-corruption advice. So the ambassador of China was sort of like coming and saying, why don't you guys work on China more? It's such a corrupt country. We would really need your advice. We really mean to change this country. And it was uh, anyway extraordinary for me to hear a Chinese ambassador acknowledging that this country is corrupt, saying, God, even communism changes. You know, I'm, I'm behind times. It would have never happened in my youth. And then we go on. I said, what the hell can I tell meaningfully to this guy? Because he seems he seemed to mean well. And in the end, I said, look, none of what I recommend, which as you have noticed, is very close to what Michael recommends, is this development of normative constraints in a society, build a strong, obviously this would not fit China, right? They would not invite us in to build uh, coalitions to reverse the vicious power distribution generating corruption in, in that country. So I said, what the hell can you do? I said, I don't know, I know, you can do what the King of Denmark did. Okay, I can send you a whole paper by a Danish historian whom I gave 
gave a questionnaire and very kindly compiled a list of steps exactly what this, this enlightened monarch did. And uh, you know, just just one more word to the earlier question on uh, on areas which are under international control. Well, there is where you see this resources versus constraints model working very well. Most areas which are under international control, most post-conflict areas, are the most corrupt areas in the world. Afghanistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, they're all horribly corrupt. Why are they so corrupt if we control them? Okay, so it seems to be like an obvious explanation that their own states are, are weak. But we are there by, we I understand the international community, why are they so corrupt? Well, the answer is that the resources that we pour in these countries are so <coughs> enormous. In Kosovo, I calculated that the procurement, it's over a third of, of Kosovo's GDP, the procurement coming out from international assistance. I mean, these are extraordinary opportunities. Such opportunities, actually what happened is that they corrupt people from international community who work there before you know helping the locals afghanistan is even is even worse there is a good part of it you know at, in kosovo which is the tiniest we sometimes i mean the international community also does the policing you arrest ministers for corruption you know i mean i dreamed in my life to see in romania coming someone coming coming from brussels and arresting ministers from corruption actually i would applaud this i would not consider it an infringement of national sovereignty but it doesn't work like this <laughs> the thing is that it's really really very complicated to create this equilibrium, which is a domestic equilibrium. Despite all the international money and everything which was said, definitely it's international money fueling it. And this is how it always went. We had this 18th century discussion, you know, but then is when, when Europeans became fully aware of corruption, it was when first time the British went to India and they engaged in relationship there. This was like the first wave of globalization, so to speak. And it was immediately followed by a first wave of, of corruption. Why? Because there was a reasonable control of corruption built in Britain, but there was none in India. The question is, can you be in something between Britain and India, or you will have to actually build it in India? And you, I think that everything that could have been done in between was done wonderfully by Peter and other people. This foreign convention, uh, bribery acts, and th there's, those do exist. But there is no other way of preventing corruption than building a similar control in India to what you have been in Britain. Otherwise, there will always be money. It doesn't matter where they come from. Money always exists when opportunity is there. Right here in the aisle, in the blue. Uh, I'm going to ask a question about uh, the case of Argentina. Mm -hmm. I think Michael Johnston will be prepared to answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, with the developing uh, democracy and uh, increasing corruption. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an excellent question because Argentina is an, an example of what I call elite cartel uh, corruption, uh, in which you have the most the strongest institutions in the country being not so much the formal institutions, but rather the ones built among elites out of collusion. Now, that's an interesting kind of corruption because it, it um, provides a sort of de facto stability and predictability that can be consistent with economic growth. Uh, another one of my elite cartel countries is South Korea, which in the mid-70s was uh, amazingly poor and is now, what, the 10th or 12th largest economy. Argentina has a way of oscillating between boom and bust. I mean, it's a country of just immense uh, um, uh, potential. But um, what is uh, striking about politics there is that, uh, you know, there are elections. There have been for 30 years. They're held uh, regularly and so forth. Uh, but there is, in some respects, surprisingly little uh, uh, competition. Um, competition is between the factions of the uh, Justicialista Party, as I understand it, the Peronista Party that, uh, um, you know, really divides between itself the, uh, the political spoils. Um, much of the most important electoral politics takes place at the state level, and governors end up um, uh, sort of controlling the members of the national legislature in a variety of ways, uh, and those governorships don't change hands between the parties. Uh, something like 20, uh, uh, I think something like uh, 16 out of the 23 or 4 state governorships have been in the same hands more or less continuously uh, since Argentina became an electoral, uh, an electoral, uh, uh, electoral uh, democracy. 
democracy. So in that sense, you know, here is another case of a society that, again, has the hardware in place, um, you know, of, of democracy, but the competition is not there. Um, the, the, the push for any kind of accountability and transparency has at times been frustrated by the uh, courts, uh, by the legislature, by the, um, on a couple of occasions, the president's more or less sweeping out a majority of the Supreme Court and putting their, their own people in. Um, that doesn't speak well for the ability to, uh, to check power. Um, you know, where do you go with that? I think uh, some changes to the electoral system and to political finance might be one way in which to work, um, pushing, if, we're, if it were possible, to diversify the economy, to bring more different interests um, into the political process would be a good kind of long-term bet. Um, as it stands, though, um, elite cartels is a kind of uh, governance that is highly corrupt. It isn't good corruption, but it's governance that at times is just good enough to keep surviving and to provide enough material security for uh, many people to, uh, to refrain from really challenging the system. So I think Argentina um, is, is one of the toughest cases um, in the long run to, uh, uh, to diagnose. Uh, in the back. If you could just also state your name. My name is David Tessitore with OpenPittsburgh.org. And this is a question actually for the audience. Um, since all of us here are interested in the subject of corruption and dealing with it, there is a list uh, out front for people to sign up so that we can communicate for the lift serve among ourselves. And if, if you guys would sign that you're, you want to be in communication so that we can continue this discussion, that would be very helpful. I really appreciate that myself. Great, thank you. In the back, woman um, near the aisle with the red sweater. Uh, hi, my name is Nina Ileva. Um, I have a question. Can you uh, please stand up? Uh, I have a question to Shewa Krumholz, and um, she mentioned that transparency is the uh, shortest way to guard against <laughs> corruption. The transparency is the surest way to guard against uh, corruption. So um, I would ask what strategies for you are the most efficient uh, and uh, uh, increasing transparency uh, to, uh, to be able to um, check the government, how government distributes the public money, and uh, what do you think about the electronic governments and um, your experience with that? Electronic government? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, we, uh, so your first point was about uh, how to. And, and how the public money are distributed from the government. We, we do not focus on how public money is distributed, but there are organizations like, uh, for instance, um, uh, fedspending.org, oh, sorry, what was that? Revenue Watch, Revenue Watch yeah. uh, and fedspending.org follows contracts and grants, and that, of course, now is available on usaspending.org, too. So there are a number of uh, places, but, uh, but we focus on political money in politics, um, not just campaign contributions, but, but do not follow um, distributions from, from the government. Um, uh, you know, I think you were mentioning the quote, which I took from Transparency International, but r with regard to transparency's um, fundamental role in preventing or stopping corruption. But uh, my own view is, first of all, we're not a reform organization in the sense that we're not a campaign finance reform organization, but we do advocate transparency because we feel that it's essential, whatever the situation, however it's governed, we need to be able to see uh, where the money's coming from and going to and, and the timing and the quantities and, and to understand the true sources because without that, uh, we can't truly feel assured that of the integrity of our government and um, uh, we can't even have a conversation about it. So that's just fundamental. And technology is, I think, one of the most helpful signs and hopeful signs for the future, that this will disseminate the information more meaningfully to people in ways that they can integrate and use in their 
daily lives and not simply be, I mean, when I got to Washington, it was literally in dusty filing cabinets. Um, and I, we were using microfiche readers and sitting on the fl dusty floors of, of uh, government offices. And now, of course, you know, apps are popping up every week. We get contacted by another organization saying, great data, we just built an app. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, there's no demand. The demand is not great right now. But I think that as it disseminates and becomes more, uh, people understand that all of this information is finally bubbling up um, slowly. Uh, they will, you know, uses uh, that are real will be created and, and found. Unfortunately, the administration is working slower than civil society organizations had anticipated and, frankly, you know, expected to produce the data. And so um, after some false starts, we're finally at the point where we're getting an inventory of the data um, in the next year to know exactly what is actually collected by the government, what data is out there. Um, but, but, you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We'll take anything at this point. Could I add a small note to that too, and that is that uh, you know people, you know there is a there is a core of people who really do pay close attention, and I don't mean just people working for campaigns, but uh, people who pay close attention to what CRP makes available, to what the Federal Election Commission makes available. Um, my friend Bert Levine at Rutgers and I did a uh, had had a, uh, a series of questions on an Eagleton Institute survey um, earlier in the year, in which we asked people, you know, do they follow information on political money and political finance and we thought that we would be getting four or five and six percent saying they did and we were getting you know in the high 20s or something it was really you know again that's not a majority and maybe some of those people are saying oh yeah I do what good citizens should do when they don't but still I think the interest is there um, better reporting and, anal and analysis uh, by journalists I think would be so very helpful thank you uh, gentlemen in the blue sweater Right, you, yes. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Namdi Bokwe. I'm a uh, PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins. And my question is for Alina. Uh, specifically, when you spoke about uh, empowering the permanent losers. Um, we've been discussing throughout the conference corruption in a negative lens, and surely it is. You know, it's a stain on the fabric of society. Um, it debilitates government, development, et cetera. But what happens when you have a situation where that is not the case? And it's not just a culture of corruption, but corruption is hegemonic to the state. Um, and it's not just the political actors who act in this manner, but it's prevalent throughout society. And you have business to business, citizen to citizen, this is the status quo. So you take a country like Nigeria, where good is seen as evil, evil is seen as good, and any voice that speaks out against corruption is either ignored or silenced. So when you talk about your mechanisms for, I think you called it uh, horizontal accountability and monitoring, how do you mobilize those mechanisms when you have a state that has no real impetus to collective action? Um, how do you kind of engender dissent when you have a state of where corruption is hegemonic? Thanks. Thank you. I guess the question is really on how to start a virtuous circle, right, more or less, out of a vicious circle. So first, there is no society in which only the leaders are, are bad, right? As I suggested, this is a state in, in, in society thing. Leaders manage to resist, unless they are, you know, the most ruthless killers, they manage to resist because they create networks. They create networks of clients, and they manage to have some support. Right? Otherwise, they would, they would not resist. So everywhere, everywhere, uh, not, not only in Nigeria or not only in, uh, in the least developed countries, you find corruption in society as well. You know, in, in, in my country, people didn't understand very well that uh, those who discussed a lot about corruption, for instance, academics, they were themselves extremely corrupt. There had never been a really open competition in any university. People considered normal that only one candidate showed up for a job and nobody else showed up because they knew whose job it was, you know? So I sort of had to do a big competition among universities to, to shake this off. And uh, we didn't win this battle. So when I started this, I did this two years in a row. I give you as an example of things that you can do. 
right? I, we had over 40 corrupt state universities. Can I call them all corrupt? Yes, I can call them all corrupt. None of them ever held a merit-based competition, these public universities. It doesn't mean that anyone working there was incompetent, but most people were. This is why Romania doesn't have any university in the Times Higher Education Supplement top, because universities are no good. Why don't students protest? Students are the consumers. Why don't they protest to do something? Well, they don't, because for them it's also fairly affordable to just go there, pay what I think are quite low sums now and then for exams, and get a degree. Why? Who wants to get a degree without an education, you would ask, right? You need the education as well. Well, you don't, because in a corrupt country, with the you anyway, you find a job by favoritism and by networking. You know, somebody will just give you the job. So, But the job now these days has some sort of formal requirement. So it's better to come up with a diploma from the law if the job is to be a lawyer. It doesn't matter if you really know something about law or not. <laughs> so this is indeed a horrible, vicious circle, which seems to us everywhere. And I know Nigeria because I put it in my policy class and it's always the students always struggle with a, with something which seems to be like classic market failure externality, this uh, oil spillage in, in the delta. But in the end, when you look and you see that it's actually the, the corrupt government there which doesn't do anything to enforce law and the people themselves who break the pipelines to steal oil, destroying their own environment, you really don't know where to start, where to stop all this and to start. Well, there is no uh, no easy answer to this, but the answer nevertheless is that some people do lose. Some people do lose and some people do have some autonomous basis. This kind of groups you find in the European history, I mean, they can be, let's say, you know, British traders, British traders who stayed to profit out of really open trade. And therefore, they started a battle on the government because the government was actually the one provoking, inflicting losses on them by its intervention. This is how this whole uh, liberal discussion started. You know, they simply profited out of this and they wanted the government out. You cannot do anything unless you have some group to start for. Now, historically, these groups have to ally with other groups and grow. There is no other way of, of doing this. Of course, if somebody comes to government who is uh, you know, enlightened and who will try to do this top down, they, they can very well try. It's always good and the government makes the first step to build trust. But we have very, very few circumstances when this happens. Government make the first step when they are pushed, when they are constrained by society to make the first step. And I realize the answer is very frustrating in a society where it's very poor because it's really, really difficult to build constraints. But also the encouraging things is that we have new tools which help us work. I mean, look at all these grassroots anti-corruption revolutions, I would call them so, in the last two years, based on social media. You know, three years ago, I was trying to stop this gold mining project in, again, in my country. I live in Berlin, but I'm still, of course, very much involved because I don't think we, lo we won the battle. I could have not done this, despite the fact that I had access to television, that I had a lot of followers. Today, with the Facebook this, this fall, we just managed to get 50,000 people in the streets in just two weeks. And we managed to stop this project. The project was supported by both prime minister and by president. And it seems that we had absolutely no chance in this, but we managed. We managed because it's far more easier. I mean, people become activists quite a lot. I mean, look at these famous bloggers in, in Mexico who report on, on organized crime with, the, with really with the risk of their lives. Some of them pay with their lives. And you never have to get to a majority, unlike elections. In anti-corruption, you don't have to get to 51%. Never. It is enough if you manage strategically in certain circumstances to mobilize certain groups. And at a certain point, you will be able to send the signal that the norm is changed. You will be able to change the norm. It doesn't mean that the next day, norm will be 90% ethical universalism. It's just you will be able to make the qualitative uh, step ahead. And uh, this is what, what you should aim. But of course, it takes a lot of effort. Michael, you want to? Oh, well, I was just uh, thinking of an historic, historic, historical example. Pardon me, long day. Um, who? How did the issue of patronage first end up on the the agenda as an abuse of power um, in England? Well, it turned out that in the late Tudor era, a lot of young university graduates, of whom there were not very many, were used to getting jobs in the church or in in what was becoming the government, um, more or less as a matter of course, you know, through their personal networks. Well. Um, 
Over time, Oxford and Cambridge started grinding out many more graduates than there was room for, and there was a constituency that started raising the whole issue of, well, how are these jobs handed out? What kind of patronage do we and don't we tolerate? And the notion was not that they were mobilized to produce better personnel policy, but rather they had a grievance and that brought them uh, you know, into an, an active political role. So you could have a lot of different groups at the table, um, you know, t two dozen groups maybe protesting 19 different issues, but together they maybe, maybe have the capacity to place some limitations on central power. Gentleman on the aisle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a question for Aline and Michael. Thanks for your great presentations. Uh, I have a question about what you think about the connection between anti-corruption conventions and human rights. Mm -hmm. Now, when we got the Human Rights Declaration in 1948, nobody took it seriously for one, two, three, four decades. But actually, it's become quite important. When the Soviet leaders signed the Helsinki Declaration, they really didn't understand that they were signing their own death sentence. Mm -hmm. And suddenly people in Eastern Europe started to hold their governments accountable, saying, you have actually signed this petition. I have the right to, and you have signed. Now we have the UN decla Declaration, we have many other declarations, and the step from human rights to anti-corruption is, in my view, not so far-fetched, not having to pay bribes to get your kids immunized or not having to use contacts to get into universities is not so very far from human rights things. So I'm just uh, thinking maybe in two or three decades <laughs> the conventions, people around the world, especially what Alina is saying, and I agree completely with the use of, 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 uh, of social media, so might be holding their governments accountable to these conventions. Is this maybe a route forward that we, we try, I think we tend to look away from them as unimportant, but maybe that's a mistake. Yeah, yeah, an emphatic yes from me, and uh, further, and I think the Helsinki um, example and how it unwittingly spawned Human Rights Watch and a variety of other constituencies is, is a great one. Um, the, the missing link, as uh, Susan Rose Ackerman pointed out, um, often is enforcement mechanisms uh, or some kind of commitment mechanism for the anti-corruption conventions. I mean, they have um, very useful kinds of mutual monitoring and the like, and that's all to the good. Um, but, uh, you know, where could a uh, an exploited citizen group go um, and prove that they have enough standing to demand that action be taken to compel a government to abide by what it has has signed on to? Um, we don't have that yet, and so I think um, you know I'm, I, I, I like I love that argument, and I would like to see enforcement mechanisms put in with a specific eye to that connection. Well, I, I agree, but uh, fortunately there's a small difference here which will color the, this answer, which is may, many of you probably have not read this United Nations Convention Against Corruption that we now have. If those of you who read it, you will see that in fact ethical universalism is now official and I think 148 countries or something like this have mm -hmm. pledged to do this. Not anti-corruption, but really ethical universalism. Countries pledge there to do consultations for every policy formulation. Transparency is number one law, so it is really something extraordinarily demanding. You ask yourself why countries sign this, but it really doesn't matter. But what I think is that it's not enforcement by countries which is going to, to bring this. But I think that this is like an arm that we are offering to these domestic coalitions for change that they can use against their corrupt political elites. All right, now if these coalitions do not exist, these are like unexploded grenades. You just, you know, throw them over the prison wall, but they're going to be there. But if there is somebody to pull out the pin, then they're going to do their work. What I would say, I mean, as a researcher now, not as an activist, is that so far, they don't seem to play very well. I do not find any, any statistical evidence that countries which adopted this versus countries which didn't uh, changed more or in any way. And one reason is that uh, we are not using the, the process of, of, of implementing this UNCAC very well. Many countries, for instance, do not want that this review process, which is a peer review process, other countries come and assist 
access you. They don't even want it to be transparent. So ma many of these 148 countries in the world do not even know that their countries ratified UNCAC. I mean, let's be serious. The ratification of a convention, it's not news. Nobody really read it, and it's not in the best interest of government to promote this. All right, so one thing that we should really advocate for at international as well as national level is that this UNCAC peer reviewing process is entirely transparent, that it is turned into some sort of general assembly of every anti-corruption community of a country, investigative journalists, organizations, NGOs, such as, as Shilas, which do exist now. Every country does have two, three watchdogs, right? And it would be entirely different if the government comes and reports what they have done to implement this, even if they don't do anything. It will create some sort of dynamic. And this is something that we should stimulate if we want to speed up this process and turn this convention into, into real fact as happened with the Human Rights Convention. Now that's, a, that's excellent context for the enforcement process because um, you know, if, if it is a matter of just domestic constituencies challenging domestic authority, well, you know, in the Philippines every several years they turn out millions of people on EDSA to uh, protest the government and it produces great change for a few weeks. But uh, there's an old argument from E. E. Schatzschneider says that if you look at a political fight, the first thing to look for is what does the audience do? What was, does the crowd do? Does it stay out? Does it jump in on one side or another? Enforcement mechanisms, if they can be a way for those domestic constituencies to make their fight the world's fight as well, or the UN's fight, or regional uh, allies fight as well, that becomes more of an even fight, or maybe even it tips in a good direction. Thank you. So we're uh, very tight on time, so we'll take uh, one more round of questions. Maybe we can get two in, and then we'll have the give the panelists a chance to respond and to wrap up. This gentleman's had his hand up for a while, so go ahead, and then we'll take one other. Uh, my name is Mutaba Sekimonio. I'm a grad student here at the New School. Uh, I'm from Congo, so I'm looking at it from that perspective. Uh, what, what is your intake uh, when we say, like, uh, corruption uh, organization are just used by the Western world to blackmail uh, dictator in in poor country. We we seen like uh, Mobutu was a great guy until he fell up with the West, he became a dictator. And you see this going on even Guinea Equatorial, when people they knew uh, the system in play that there's corruption, but it always come out when the government fell out with the Western, uh, Western countries. Okay, great, Let just wait one moment, we'll take one more, um, right there, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm Jude, I'm nearly from Nigeria. Um, I just want to ask, because um, from what you said, um, it is nice we have the UNCAC, and uh, it's much more important that the, the, the citizens of the world have a way of also gathering just like the governments of the world have used the United Nations to keep the citizens down. I'm wondering if you have any idea of what can trigger this kind of gathering, because the citizens also need to come together to be able to disrupt the very comfortable system that is benefiting the few. You know, do you have, um, I'm a bit excited about the need for opposition, especially those who lose out to be strengthened, but much more, are, are there likely systems that can link up the oppositions across the globe to share experience. So why don't you each take a chance to both respond and also add any last remarks that you'd like to share. Okay, this civil society, international civil society, I think that there are quite a lot of fora now where people meet and exchange experiences. I created this web page, for instance, againstcorruption.eu. Coming out of an evaluation project, we assessed civil society anti-corruption projects for 10 years in 15 East European countries. So we simply looked to see what works and what doesn't work, and 90-something percent didn't work. It was just seminars organized, spending donors' money, or coalitions put <laughs> together by donors who the next day after the money was spent disappeared, and something like this. But I think that I'm seeing more and more effective work in the last years. And I do not believe that in any country, uh, civil society should be driven by donors. It's very good if donors fund it. 
all right? But the, again, the Facebook and other things that we have these days bring together a new form of funding. You know, you can ask for very little for a large number of people from your own country. So to be less donor dependent, and people would give you one dollar, but you are able to find 10,000 people to give you one dollar because you have 10,000 followers on Facebook, then you already become a little bit more independent. And uh, it doesn't really matter if outsiders like or do not like, uh, you know, who your leader is. Of course, it's a better situation when you can create cross pressures from below and from outside. We had this in Eastern Europe due to EU accession. So we simply pushed from from both directions. But it really does not matter. You just have to use whatever you have at your disposal. Go to court. We didn't discuss at all about this. Right? Whenever you have tenure judges, so you start having some reasonable judicial capacity, not a lot, just litigate for transparency. Go to court a lot. You know, this will also develop the capacity of courts. I've been to courts for 18 years now, from the first trial that I made for transparency. Originally, it took a lot. We didn't win anything. Now, in the last three, four years, we simply win any anything. Plus, the corrupt people st stopped suing us, and it's just us suing the government. And the judges learned, and now they really find ministers. They find them in five, uh, in five days. Uh, these people pay more than their salary per month if they delay making public a privatization contract or another contract that you ask and you, and you should be public. So just use everything. It's not one weapon. You have to take people in the street, go to court, use transparency, monitor the assets of dignitary. It's quite a big, complex amount of things. And you have to do all this in, the, in your free time, of course, because nobody's is not a full-time job. Nobody's going to pay you to do this. But if indeed you are motivated to do this, I really believe that it can be done. Just don't expect results. I mean, if you want your children to live in that country, okay, then you have to organize to do this for, for many years. Thank you. Yeah, uh, international civil society, uh, a wonderful idea that is uh, gaining a lot of traction, in part because its effects are beginning to be seen and through some uh, somewhat surprising directions. It's plagued, of course, by huge collective action uh, problems and uh, by the fact that there are so many issues that international civil society could address. And, you know, really corruption is, is just one of them. I think with respect to, you know, corrupt regimes, if international civil society um, needs to learn one thing, it is that pushing the bad guys out is just the start of the job. Um, you know, the job continues after that. And uh, one of the problems, and we had this with political machines in the U.S., is if you vote, if you vote the machine out, you've got to put something in its place because there were a lot of uh, constituencies that had a stake in the bad old ways of doing things, and they can bring the machine back. Well, you know, perhaps one thing international civil society could do, and perhaps through crowdfunding, who knows, is to, you know, help people within the society start building that something that's something next. I mean, there are a lot of highly corrupt societies where people pool little bits of their own savings and they wouldn't steal a penny from each other. You know, that's a place where maybe civil society can connect with civil society. Great, thank you, Sheila. Um, I, this seems like those seem like two questions that are best addressed by the people who are working in the international community. So, mm -hmm. great. Well, thank you to all three of our panelists. Thank you.